about what is an operating system, what are its purpose to understand why we made our operating system this way, and about the GNU project and why is the earth so important for the GNU project. Uh, then I will speak about the two general conceptions of operating system, monolithic or microcanals, and after I will explain uh, what the GNU is, how it works, what are the concepts very small, a very short introduction about the future because Marcus will speak on L4 in a long time tomorrow, so I will not speak in detail about it. And after questions on demonstration, show on the laptop and the list running. This is powered by Noah right now. This laptop. So, what's an operating system? At first, computers were very big, very slow, very expensive. A computer only ran one program at once. It was simple programs. And, well, there were no systems, there were just tapes or even careful cards. And the computer did its things for several hours, and then you get the answer on the printer. After, the computer was still very expensive, but faster. So we began to have time sharing, which is on the same computer, at the same time, several people run several programs. And as soon as you do that, you need to have something, an operating system, which will share the resources, CPU, memory, hard disk, network, whatever, between the process that run on the computer. You need an operating system to do some protection, some security stuff, to avoid one program, one buggy program run by one user to crash the whole system, or to prevent data corruption from a user to another one, or even to enforce privacy. Some users do not want everyone to read everything they write. So, and the third purpose is hardware abstraction layer, that is, we don't want to write in each program the support of IDEA drives, SCSI drives, and cd of DVD. We just want to know that it's something where we can write and read data, and well, a layer, which is the operating system, to take care about speaking to the real hardware. <coughs> This is what an operating system is. What is the GNU project? I think you all here know what is the free software. The goal of the GNU project is to give back freedom to users. Giving back freedom first goes to the legal way, by having a free software license which allows every user to understand what the, what the program does, to change it, to improve it, to fix it, to adapt it to its name. But also, by the way the program is made, we want to make the new operating system in a way in which users can easily change the behavior of the operating system, add their own component, and when the needed security does not become a burden preventing people from mounting uh, uh, ISO image. Uh, you can't mount on Unix, you can just mount. Uh, is the image if you are not true to the computer. So, <coughs> now that we have the 
goals, what is a, what do we call a kernel? Many programs do not need direct access to hardware. In fact, it's not only that they do not need it, it's we want to prevent them from having direct access to hardware because we want to do security on resource sharing. In order to do this in a way that a malicious or buggy program will not create corruption, we need support by the hardware. <coughs> Without, if the hardware allows any program to <coughs> communicate with the security call, we cannot enforce security. So, hardware on any modern computer define at least two execution level programs and either be in channel mode where they can do whatever they want or in user mode where they are restricted in what they can do. It's at least two, some architecture defines three or four or even more execution levels. But we keep with the simple two model which is the general one. And in this two levels, we have two spaces. We have the kernel space, that is the same of all programs running in kernel mode, and user space, all programs running in user mode. So what's the basic design of operating system? It's to have a monolithic kernel. Everything that access to the hardware, or shower sources, or do things which are general to every program like the TCP IP protocol, which is not really into hardware. It's a resource sharing because TCP IP ports are limited, but it's not really resource sharing either. It's just something that is common to all tasks. It's inside the kernel. On the kernel, they find many system scores, more than 200 uh, Linux. To, for the user space program to ask the channel to do something on the channel, do it or not, if it's not allowed. But this design has several problems. The first one is that coding in channel mode is hard. You need to reboot to test. Sure, there are emulators, but still you need to reboot the emulator to test. And you don't have access to full debuggers. Mm -hmm. GDB, you don't have profilers, you don't have such stuff. And bugs can have side effects in a program. If you have a bug in part of the program, it can corrupt data structure used by another part of the program. And a bug in the soon cat driver can corrupt data of the file system because it has corrupted the buffer used by the file system driver. So it's Big problem, and another problem is a modularity. Problem because everything is one big program, and you can't just change one component with another. Users cannot run their TCP IP stack or file system as they wish. So we think this is a big box. Um, when we, we saw it, for example, at the Linux 2.4 era, when you had two virtual memory systems the one from Andrea, the one from Ray. And you had some file system like X, XFS, which only run with one of the virtual memory. You cannot, you could not use the virtual memory management you wished with the file system you wished. You were forced to choose the file system which worked with the memory management code. It was not really wonderful. So the idea is to, instead of having a big kernel, shrink it and we remove some parts of it. So what does stay in the channel? First you need to have a way for the remaining to communicate with each other because the services which will not be in the channel will be in the user space and you need a normal user space program to be able to submit requests <coughs> to the, the servers in user space, which does what the kernel we used to do. So we need interprocessus communication, a way for two user space programs to speak with each other. We need basic access to the hardware and resources, the basic scheduler. The most simple scheduler is just a way to say, 
give the CPU to this task of this type, or then some thing in user space to this type. You need basic memory handling for allowing a task to access some part of the physical memory on basic input output primitives to speak with the rest of the array. But all the remaining are put in the user space, the real scheduler, which decide which task to give the CPU, or the memory handling, the real code of the memory handling, which will decide which memory frames we keep in memory when there is when we have to swap, when there's not enough memory, which one to keep or which one to put on the swap, to handle the swapping, the file systems, network stacks, nearly everything is now in the user space. So how does this big thing work now? It works with remote procedure calls. A remote procedure call is when you have a client on the server and the client do a request to the server, the server proceeds with the task and then sends the answer to the client. It's as if you were calling a C function but it's not your own task which will do the code, but another task. So you need two messages, one to submit the request, and so on. Uh, in order to do that more easily, to not have each time we want to do an RPC to create the message, encode it, submit it, write for the answer, read the answer, do the answer, um, we have stubs. Stubs are automatically submitted <coughs> code from definition files, which are similar to .h files, or if you use .idn files. And the stubs provide an RPI, which is one of your programming language. If you program in C, the stub will create a C function that you just have to call with C parameters, and this function we do the, what we call the marshalling, that is encoding of the parameters, the sending of the message, it will wait for the answer and do the decoding. That's what we can see on this. There you have the client, it will do a code to the stub, the stub will read on the parameters, send the message to the stub of the server, the stub of the server will decode the parameters, call natively the function of the server, it will do its computation, and the server will be shown, the server stub will encode the answer, the answer will be sent with a second message, decoded, and sent back to the client. It's transparent for the client and for the server. So now that we have, uh, sorry, it's a bit sketchy, but uh, uh, now that we have this, what do we do? The first step is to take everything that we moved out of the channel and put it in one big test on user space. So you have the channel, which is just the panel, IPC, basic virtual memory and such. Then you have the program, bash, emacs, whatever, and a big server. Every time you need a service, you do an IPC to the big server, the big server does the step and so on. So examples are the first the first operating system to use the microkernel, Mac OS. And L4 Linux, L4 Linux is the port of Linux kernel to the L4 microkernel. So you have L4 in kernel space and as a basic server on user space you have Linux. What do we win by doing that? We, we have a bit more independent hardware, mostly. The most hardware dependent stuff are inside the micro kernel. Um, this big server is far less dependent from our hardware. It's a bit easier to develop. And well, we have two components instead of one, so we have a bit less of side effects. But it's still not modular, and we still have side effects because we still have in this big thing some possibility of side effects. So the next step is to split this big server into one server per task. 
it's far more modular. You can just run the programs in the TCP IP stack like a normal program. You have a far better fault tolerance. If one of the server crash or does whatever, you do not have corruption on the file system or kernel panic. Development is easier because you can use GDB, profiler, Valgrim, whatever you want on the, on the servers. But there are two problems. One is that you have many lines of communications now because you do LS. LS will ask to the X2 file system server what is inside the directory, which will ask to the IDR server what is uh, on the block of the disk, which will ask to the PCI driver to do the request to the PCI IDR card. So you can have several levels of communication which can take time and we need to define interfaces like a protocol of communication between those components if you want to be able to replace one component by another easily they have to answer the same RPC, the same interface so now that we know what are the different kind of operating system what is the GNUMA? the GNUMA is a set of servers, libraries, and interfaces that run on top of a micro kernel and provide what is no longer inside the kernel. So, this will be a bit pointy and stuff. The herd is, is not a micro kernel, it's not an operating system, it's just the layer between, between but it's at the same level as real tasks, but it's all the stuff that is no longer in the micro -kernel. And GNU, or GNU, but it's the GNU operating system, is the full, the full disk. With uh, a micro kernel, the GNU C library, the GNU utilities, and so on. So, the LERD is the core of the GNU project. Because of that, we have to take into huge consideration the goals of the GNU project, of the GNU project, and the GNU manifesto, which is giving back freedom <coughs> to users. I want the freedom to be able to develop my own TCP IP stack even if I have not root on the computer because I am a student in a university. And another goal which was started in the GNU manifesto is to stay compatible with what exists already, that is Unix, for these operating systems. But we do not want to stay blindly compatible and to keep with all the limits we know for this app. So we want to stay compatible but without the limits. So we have interfaces between all these components which are clearly defined in the .dev file that it's like that hash files and which should not change when you get create new ones if you need a completely different kind of service but the ones that exist will not change every, every version to, so we can keep the goal is to be able to replace part of the system we have several schedulers, several virtual memory, several file systems and you can just choose the component you want so we need the interfaces to be fixed so we don't have any more compatibility problem between this file system on this virtual memory and we want to when, when I say we want to bypass or overthrow the limits of POSIX uh, just two examples the first one is anonymous file creation and often, well often, sometimes you have programs that needs a file that is only accessible to itself so what is done usually is you create the file, open it, then you remove it. On Unix, when the file which is opened is removed, it is not really deleted until it is closed. So you have this file which has no longer any name on the file system because it is removed, so you cannot open it again, but it is opened by the current task, and the task can use it to store data. But you have uh, very small amount of time between the creation and the destruction of the file where someone can open it and read what is inside it. And there are some security 
Apache all that we are using, this small time when the file was completed. So we have a way to create a file without ever giving it a name. So just a small example. Another example which is more important in the desktop era is notifications. On Unix systems, you have no way to be cleanly informed of when a file is modified, when a file is created with someone. So you have demons like file, farm file alteration monitor or newer stuff that just do the work by watching over the file on looking and polling at regular interval to see if the file turned or not. So we have a way to ask to a file system server, I want to be notified when this file is changed. And then, when it is changed, the file system server will send a call and an RPC to inform the change. So, how can we do better than Unix did? How can we do without the limits of Unix? It's not but because we are smarter than the one who did Unix. They are very smart. I never say that I'm better than them, but the thing is what we have experience. Unix is 30 years old now. We have 13 years, 30 years when we used Unix. We know now its limits on computers have evolved in this time and we have new needs on computers, so it's time to do something different. By keeping all the good things of Unix, but also by throwing by having the limits of Unix that experience gets. <laughs> so a bit story of the GNU. The GNU project was started in 83. But at this time it was <coughs> work was done on user level stuff, say library, compiler, editor, debugger, such stuff. In 88 only, it was decided that GNU will use MARM micro command will be based on micro kernel and that micro command will be MARM 3. Because MARM was new at this time. We have to know that in 83, MARM did not exist. So, but there was a license problem. So we have had to wait until 91 for the university that did MAR to release a version of it under a GPL compatible license. And at this year, the work was funded. The work project was started. Three years later, it booted for the first time, booted with a shell and everything. And three years later, we had the 0 0.2 version, which is the last released version, even if a lot of work was done since, but we never did the 0 0.3 release. But it's very different for the Earth uh, at this time. We did a lot of work. And in 98, the project was restarted when Marcus founded the Debian GNU Hunt. So now what do we have in 2002, we reach Four cities. Now we have nine cities of Debian application with which work. So nine of the twelve or thirteen, or maybe fourteen <coughs> of the search. <coughs> we started the port with new micro kernel L4. I will speak very shortly about it later, and Marcus will do a talk about it tomorrow. We have support of POSIX thread. We add support of threads since the beginning but of Mars threads, not of POSIX threads. So now we have POSIX threads. In 2003, so only two years ago, the first version, the other one, of the L4 version we won was released. So the real work on L4 was started. In 2004, um, now it's included, we managed to get rid of a limitation that was often speaked of on slash dot trolls, <laughs> which is the fact that we, was, we were not able to manage file systems bigger than 2 gigabytes. Now we can do it. Oh. So 
will on this year will do we have on the health report we have the first program is banner but still it's a program which is running on and for earth and we have a GNOME port which is not 100 percent complete but it's usable so ma what is ma ma is one of the first which is uh, an university project to implement a theory, the microkernel theory, which was very new at this time. At this time. It has a lot of new concepts. The IPC system, MAR as a complex and powerful IPC system, which did not exist at that time. There was no CORBA, there was no XML IPC or whatever. It was designed for multiprocessor system on the red clusters. Um, there is a very powerful feature that I will detail later, which is external projects. It is the first system where concepts like task, thread were clearly and cleanly defined in most Unix, including Linux. It's a bit fuzzy, you have thread, task, processors. Uh, on Linux, well, it's changed a bit on the 2.6, but before it was the same system called Clone to create a new thread in the current process or to create a new process. The concepts were a bit fuzzy. And it is the first microkernel to be to have a success. It was taken by OSF1, and it is a modified version of Smart, which is in Apple's. Mac OS X. So it was also the base of the Mac OS, Mac OS sorry, operating system, which was mono server based with a server called UX, which was BSD compatible. It's still developed today, but they are going away from microkernel or they are putting more stuff in the journal. So, what MAP does? MAP defines tasks. Tasks are resource containers, resource being basically memory and communication channels. It has a complex IPC system with ports, which is asynchronous, that is, use the client send the message to the client to the send the message, the message is copied to the kernel, the client can do whatever it wants the channel will deliver the message to the server when the server is ready. It has a right mechanism for the communication channel to handle security. For the virtual memory, the decision of which memory frame to keep in memory and which memory frame to eject from memory when there is not enough memory is taken by the channel, but the task of swapping the page to the order disk or whatever you want it to be stored is done by user space programs called badgers. It has a basic scheduler on device drivers. So there are two versions of GNUMA, <coughs> which is the channel used by the GNUMA. Uh, the one we use is 1.3. There is a branch which was never released, which is 2.0, but one time it was never released. It's based on the OS kit framework, which allows to use more recent drivers, but we have problem with it, and since we want to port the word on L4, we don't invest much energy into fixing the OS kit bar. On GNUMA, it works, but it's slow. It's very slow, and it's buggy. There are memory lakes and things like that. Once again, since we want to move to L4, we don't want to invest energy to fix a kernel we want to drop in the future. So, as I say, ports are, communi ports are communication channels. It's a way to communicate in map. You have receive rights. Only one task can have a receive right on the communication channel, so the ability to read messages, but one, zero, more tasks can have the same rights, that is the right to write to the communication channel. So, now that we have this channel, those applications, how do we 
get a communication channel. I have a task. I want to speak with the TCP IP stack to open the socket. How do I open a communication channel to Usually, in distributed architectures, you have naming servers. That is a special server that everyone knows about. Usually, when the task is created, it will save the communication channel to it, which does name resolution. Give it a name, and it will give you a communication channel to what is associated with its name. But there are several problems. First, you need to handle permissions in this naming service because you don't want anyone, to, any task to be able to communicate with any other program. Servers need to register to this naming service to say, hello, I am TCP IP. And it's not very flexible, you have easily name clash when you want two TCP IP stack. So the problem. So the idea of the world is that we already have big naming service in every operating system. It's the file system, the virtual file system. So why not use it? So how does it work? You have your virtual file system, you have the root node slash, which is known by everyone. This is the thing that is given to the program at create time. They know what is slash. And after, when they want to speak with someone, they will do a name resolution or with the file name lookup function, so, which will work in a record server. <coughs> you will ask, if you ask for slash home slash kilobug slash dot bash config, if you want this resource, you will do file name lookup on that. Slash will ask to slash this full thing. Slash will say, well, I don't know this, but I know that slash home is handled by this program, which is the translated <coughs> file system and the server running the file system on the partition slash home, and asking, and those, this resolution will be done, and at the end, we'll have a communication channel to the one listening to the node. So it can be an X2 or whatever file system, if it's a file, but it can be the TCP IP stack or everything else. Uh, the fact that we are using the file system gives us some nice possibilities. First, we use Unix permissions to do the access <coughs> control. If you want to have uh, a right on the communication channel, you need to have Unix permission to access this now. And another thing is that we can use snippets. When an application crash, no uh, segmentation for the what is run is slash servers slash crash. But slash server slash crash can be a thing something else. And this is the way we do it because we have three crash servers. One what, that kills the program, one that kills the program and drop a core file, and what that kills the program that Phrase the program in memory, but not kill it. And you can choose which cr which uh, program will handle the crash just by ch changing the <coughs> server crash and make it in point to the server you want to use. So, what is the translator? The translator is a program which is run like any other program with identity and rights of the user running it, which is a lean multi threader on which answer, which listen to a file system node, somewhere in the file system, on which answer to NPCs. <coughs> what NPCs? The one you, it wants to answer. File on lean NPCs like your read, your write, if you want to support the basic file operation, deal something if you want to act like a directory when you can store other files or other translators. But other specific services, proc is uh, server handling Unix processes on processes group on so you have NPCs proc to list the available list the, have a list of 
running process to have the parent process of a process and things like that, you can write your own proc server that will handle in a different way processes. It will just have to answer to those NFTs. So now but I will do a real example later, a small translator example. So first <coughs> I am just a normal user. Not root. I create a node called FTP and I say that the program listening on the node FTP will be hostless with parameters given to hostless. I go to FTP, I do ls, ls will send npc to hostmax asking file the list content of directory. It's empty, so no answer. Now I do cd ftp.fr.debian.org. What will happen? The dash will do a file name lookup on ftp.fr.debian.org to Osmax. Osmax, because it's his goal, we do a DNS resolution, internet DNS resolution on this. It will see that it does exist, though it will run the rest of, the, of its command line, ftpfs slash on and the third parameter, and second parameter, so the IP that was resolved. Um, so this node, which did not exist before I typed my CD, is now created um, as the FTPFS program listening with the correct parameters. When I do LS now, <coughs> the LS program will ask to the short node, which is FTPFS, What's the <coughs> list directory? Um, the FTPFS will fetch the data of the FTP server and on well. Now I can do it to subdirectory, type every channel I want inside this remote FTP program. Um, if I go back to Osmex, now Osmex knows that there is one node, ftp.fl and the Now that we saw translator, we will see security. How does security work on GNOME? It works with authentication token. A token is something, it's uh, usually a numeric identifier to a, a commonly trust server which holds some rights. It's a token, give you the rights to do something. Um, what is important is that you need a trusted server host that ensures that your token is valid. But when LS asks to FTPFS about something, ask <coughs> FTPFS about the content of the directory, LS and FTPFS have no reason to trust each other, but they both trust us. And us will ensure that in every communication they do, they do not pretend to have a token they do not have, or something like that. What can you do with tokens? You can use them to do operation, you can also give them to another task by sending a message to a special communication channel that every task has, which is the task control part. You can give a token to a task while it is currently executed. You can destroy token, which is you just give up a token, or you can create some token from other one. Like if you have the root token from the IAM <coughs> token, you can create a IAM, whatever user you want, token. Okay. How do we implement POSIX compatibility with that? But UIDs and GIDs are token, a specific type of token. Because a task can have from zero to infinity of token, a task can have two UIDs token. You can be at the same time two users. It is not a problem in GNOME. You have one which is the primary, which is used for the ownership of the file you create and such, but all the process you run can do whatever any of those two users can do. You can gain or lose UIDs during the execution of your program. 
So getting UID is done with the pad of Angular or someone doing the same as others, which can be very useful. For example, you open the configuration file with an editor, you change it, but you forget that you are not wrote, and your editor is not running as wrote. You cannot save the configuration file. With Ados, if you have the root password, you can add the root token to your editor, so you can save the configuration file. You can also lose UIDs. This is if you do not need them anymore for security reasons, they don't scatter. them. Um, so with this security system, how do we implement a SUID program? I'm not sure if everyone know what an SUID program is. It's a program that does not try to lose the identity of the one running it, but of the identity of the one who created the program. Like the ping command, ping needs to open a raw socket. On Unix, only a root can open a raw socket for security reasons. So the ping program is on by root and as the SUIDB, when normal user run ping, the ping program gains the root privileges. This SUID is one reason for which it's very tricky to allow non-root users to mount file systems as they wish on, on the Unix, because if I create a file which contains an X2FS image with inside a bash program owned by root with S2 bit. If I can moot this file, I will have somewhere in the file system an SUID bash. I can run it on B root. So how do we do? It's the file system translator, the so X2FS, which enforces this SUID bit. When I run a program with the SO SUID bit. It's the file system translator where the program is that will give the root token to the program. If this translator was run by a normal user, it does not have the root token, so it will not be able to give the root token because it doesn't have it. So we have absolutely no risk of uh, this. <laughs> Another server which is very useful is the password server. Password server is a very small, around 200 or 300 lines of C code, which listen to user on password, or when user needs something to authenticate the user, short its password, but it could be a Kerberos key, it could be a GNUPG <coughs> certificate, or whatever. <coughs> and if you give a user on the correct key for the user, it will give you a security token of this user. This server is very useful because when you have a SSH server of a non-anonymous FTP server on Unix program, on Unix systems, you need to have part of SSH or part of FTP which runs with root privileges, so it can create a SSH or well, a special or uh, FTP process with the right of the person who don't it. With the password server, we will not need that anymore. Those servers can just run without any privileges and they will ask to password the token in exchange of login and password. So we have absolutely no, even if there is a buffer overflow or whatever error in the code of SSH or FTP, so no risk of remote root attack. Another use of this is no <coughs> program. No program have no privileges at all. They have discarded all the tokens, so they cannot do anything. Oh, well, they can read file which, mm, because we have not only three permissions in Unix, but we have user, group, rest of the world, and no host. No host is someone I mean, absolutely no right, which is very restricted. By default, it's nothing. But you can allow them to read a few files if you want. 
And those programs, well, it's useful for the login shell. The login shell is the login program you <coughs> arrive when you boot up. It's just, it's bash, but with no privileges. And when you want to log in, you run login your user, and login will, login will ask a password, ask to the password server the token, and you will be logged in. But you can, uh, you can type cat readme, the administrator gives you a world readable readme file, you can type cat readme without being even logged to the computer. Uh, it's also very useful for untrusted content. Many data come from untrusted source, the internet for example. And it's complex data. A HTML page is very complex. Uh, Gecko or Gag. HTML or whatever, HTML or drawing program, a big, very complex program, which has many big programs, have bugs, and those bugs could be security holes. So, if you can discard identity, you could have a browser which has two processes, one which has writes, so you can download files, write the cache, and so on, but one which does the HTML rendering, the big code which is probably full of bugs with no host. So even if there is a security hole in the Gecko engine, you cannot use this to run data, to run code with any privileges on the computer. So that is for security. Now the next point I will speak of <coughs> is virtual memory. Um, what is virtual memory? What is a virtual address space? Or what does it exist? Virtual address space is to say that when a program access to memory, it does not give a physical address, it is the byte 42 of the physical memory, but it gives an address <coughs> of an address space which is foreign, which is virtual, and that something will translate this virtual address into the physical memory address. Why do we need that? We need that to implement protection. If the memory address, the physical memory address, is not bound to any virtual memory address, there is no way for the program to access the memory. Because the program only, can only speak using virtual addresses, so if the memory address, the physical address, is not bound to a virtual address, you cannot access it. Another way is to be able to load code at arbitrary physical position. For long, operating system did not use virtual memory, and each time the program was loaded in memory, they, they were forced to change all the address inside the program of the function, the variable, to take, to replace them with the physical location of the program in memory, because when you run many programs, the physical location of your program in memory changes each time you're running. It allows to share memory between applications. You just have, just need to have the same two virtual addresses mapped to the same physical location on you have memory sharing between two applications. On the, the translation, because it will be it will be too slow. It was doing software is not by hardware memory management unit which does the conversion between virtual memory and physical memory. So, what kind of virtual memory do we have? We have two kinds, segmentation and paging. I will first speak quickly of segmentation. Segmentation is just, instead of say, giving a physical address, you give segment of set kappa. Uh, the segment contains a base, base physical address, a size, and the protection mode, which is usually written link or read write, could be more, more flexible on some architecture. Uh, standards, though, on when, how it is done, the conversion is very easy. It's base plus offset, and just check that offset is not above the size. Uh, the standard segments can be made transparent if you load data 
it will use by a data segment which you would not need to specify. If you push data, if you manipulate the stack, you will not need to specify the stack segment on the one. But um, uh, it allows you to swap. If you have no memory, you can take a full segment, write it in the disk, destroy the segment in memory, freeze the memory, and when you will access the segment, you will have to reload it. But you have problems first is that the granularity is not very good. It's usually you have three, four segments per application. You have to swap one fourth of an application each time you have to swap something. You have problem of physical memory fragmentation because the segment it's just an addition, so you it has to be contiguous in physical memory. If you have two two IRA of 10 megabytes in your physical memory, but which are not connected, you cannot uh, allocate a segment of 15 megabytes. All programs must be aware of segments as soon as they stop using just the standard code data stack segments. So the second <coughs> mechanism is patching. Patching is to say that virtual address space is now linear and contiguous. It starts from zero, it goes to a maximum, which can be four gigabytes, two gigabytes, or far more in US computers. And this big space is divided in small patches, four kilobytes in Intel architecture, eight in some like alpha. And for each of these pages, you know to which physical page it's mapped or if it's not mapped. It allows far better granularity. Now you just have to swap four kilobytes when you want to swap something. And it is completely transparent for programs. So what in page B? It can be mapped. This green page is associated to this page of the physical memory. So every time someone will read or write data there, it will read or write data in this physical memory page. It can be disabled, that is not mapped to physical memory, but the data it contains are stored somewhere else, like swap. Or invalid, there is no data, nothing there if you access it, segmentation file. Uh, or, or you can have shared memory, just have to map two pages to the same physical frame and you have shared memory. When a program tries to use a patch that is not associated with physical memory, like red or yellow, it does a patch for it. So, the kernel has to handle the patch fault in a way or not. Uh, what happened with Ma? Ma choose which patch to keep in memory and which patch to discard when there is memory patch. When there is not enough memory, <coughs> Ma will decide. We choose what we call LLU algorithm, that is, it will discard the patch that, will, that was the least recently used. The model. Correct algorithm, the, the best one. The patch journals are in user space. Program that does the transfer of page to disk or back from disk to memory are user space programs. So when a program does patch fault, CPU say to say to the kernel patch fault at this address. The kernel will know which program was running. We look at which pattern under this memory, and we'll send an IPC to the pattern saying there is a patch fault. So, uh, this is how it works with MAR. Now, the full patching system. The step is discarding memory. <coughs> the discarding memory, the pattern, send message, an EPC to the pager saying, I want you to take care of this page. The pager will read the page, store it somewhere, say to Ma, okay, I'm done, you can proceed, 
now we will not the page we will remove the entry saying this virtual memory location is this physical location and everything will continue to work when this Emacs will touch this page will access either in read or write this page CPU will send a page fold MAR will send to the pager uh, restore this page please the pager will read Raw the data from whatever source he uses to stock it. We restore the page. Then it will say to Mar, I'm done. Mar will restart, continue the execution of Emacs where it was stopped. And for Emacs, except a small delay, it's transformed. If Emacs was bad, which is not the case, and access to page which was not mapped, then Ma will have seen that this page is not associated with any pager and will have said, well, this is a bug, and will have triggered the segmentation fault process. How can we use this <coughs> mechanism? The first choose is to have different kind of packing stores, because there was not only physical swap on the disk, raw physical swap on the disk. On some computers, you have a very, you don't even have a disk, or you have very slow disk, and you can have a network which is fa faster than disk, on high on post. So maybe it's more interesting to swap on the network. Instead, instead of storing memory to the disk, you will send memory to the network on the server with a big fast disk or with a lot of memory will store the page. Maybe it's also interesting to compress it. If you are working on high resolution pictures, it takes a lot of memory and it's usually data which is very well compressed. So unless of using slow disk, maybe just compressing the data but keeping it in memory can be a good way to handle this swap. Another use, um, one good thing is that you can have different pages even for the same task. The same task can have some of its memory patched with two disk pages and some of its memory patched with compressing pages. And you can even change things because the compressing pages will store data in its own memory compressed, but this compressing pages can be patched by the disk pages. So you, if there is not no more memory even, so even more memory pressure, even less memory, the compressed memory will be patched to the disk. Another use is to implement a way to have transparently shared memory between two between two computers. That is, you have a program which is just multi-threaded, not uh, cluster friendly, and you want to run it on the cluster. <coughs> we will run a special, a special pager which will map the page between the two applications as needed to ensure that it works as if they were running in the same memory. It may be slow, but in some cases, it may be very interesting. The main usage we do is disk FS because how do we manage uh, partition? file system which, have, which come from the disk, not a network file system like FTPFS, it's we map the metadata or the whole partition in memory and we use this paging mechanism to do the cache on the access to the file. In fact, it's just a big X2 memory image which is backed by Pager which does the write to the physical partition. So that's why we have the 2 gigabyte limit because we are limited to 2 gigabyte virtual address space on 32 bytes architecture, so we cannot do this way bigger partitions. So we have two solutions either we have all metadata because we do not need to map all data. We need all metadata, that is the location of the file, the attributes of the file, the name of the file, and such things. We can either 
have a tree of Pajas which map everything in an intelligent way, but it's very hard to do. The other way is to have a, we just map part of the partition, we have a cache of the mappings. This is what was done by Pugnian on the version that is now by default in the Debian neural network. There are bugs, we need beta testers on bug fixers. And Mark brings several limitations like drive device drivers have to be in kernel space, the decision of which memory page to keep on which to swap is in kernel space, we don't want that. And another problem is that we are a bit slow. Mark plays a huge role in this slowness. That's the only reason it's a loop because our code is not yet optimized. We prefer to debug it, fix it, and make it work before optimizing. And, uh, so the future with N4, Marcus will speak a lot about it tomorrow, so I will just do a very short introduction. N4 philosophy is to have just basic mechanism inside the kernel and to be smallest and fastest as possible in the microkernel level. So we have very fast IPCs, which is done by having synchronous IPCs. But synchronous IPC means that when you send a message, the two tasks have to be converting. The server has to be ready to receive the message at the same time when the message is sent. Does, is this a problem for us? No, because if we do asynchronous RPCs, if the wall, as you have seen together, the wall uh, RPC treatment has to be asynchronous, <coughs> the message itself can be synchronous. To give you a real life example, it's as if you are in a restaurant and you order a dish. The IPC is synchronous when you ask to the guy. Waiter. When you ask what you want, you will ask, you will write on this paper at the same time that you will ask. It's a synchronous IPC, but after while your dish is cooking, you can do something else. You can speak with the ones at your table or install glue on your laptop or whatever you want. Mm -hmm. um, when the RPC will be finished, you will come back to a second IPC, which is giving you your ring. And this second one is usually synchronous. You <coughs> in sounds and say you do one IPC and whatever. And so that's it for L4 because Marcus will speak longer tomorrow. So, do you have some questions? from doing the FTP to outside so I will connect to this laptop which has an FTP server. So this he has a charboard. So I want to read this charboard I will just run a char
Thank mm-hmm. you. 